Hi everybody, Will Alexander here from Will Alexander's Dog Show Tips. This week on the interview chair we have none other than Mr. Eugene Blake. Sit back and relax and listen to Gene for a while. It was great to speak with him. Hi everybody, today's special guest is none other than Eugene Blake. How's it going, Gene? I'm doing great, Jim. How are you? It's good to see you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, COVID uh, pandemic's treating you guys okay? How's Jules? Oh, she's doing good. Working like slave as usual. I mean, we, uh, she, uh, we, uh, we're going to go to a uh, dog show next weekend. So she's showing, she only been out one time this year. So uh, she's doing great. She's doing great, really. We all are doing good. The blessed. I mean, she got her shot uh, two weeks ago today and a week ago today. And I got mine's, no, two weeks ago today. And I got mine two weeks ago last Tuesday. Okay, good. Excellent. So we That's good news. Yeah, right, right. Well, it's something that we all got to do. Yeah. All right, well, let's get rolling. How old you were? How old were you, Gene? And how did you get started in dogs? How old were you when you first got started in the sport of dogs? Uh, I will tell you, like from the beginning. The beginning is like um, I was driving a delivery truck at a um, drugstore in 1954, and there was a guy there that we. It was two two drivers, so he wanted to work days, and he knew if I he got me a part time job, he could work days and I work nights. So he asked me one day. He said, "Jane, would you like to have a part time job?" Well, like I'm 18, I'm engaged to my uh, childhood sweetheart in school, and so uh, he said, "I know this woman." Who needs someone to base dogs? She said, you ain't got to like dogs. All you got to do is pretend you like dogs and you got the job because she really needs some help. And I said, well, I like dogs, you know, really, because I grew up in dogs. My father was trained gun dogs back in the Depression, back in the 30s. And the French Poodle Shop, as I said, it was on the corner of Post Oak and Westheimer, where the gallery is in Houston, Texas right now. And I applied for the job there. Her name was Hazel Ham. She had a, the French poodle shop, and her mother and father lived in the poodle shop, and she lived someplace else. And so she needed somebody to bathe dogs. So I start bathing. I applied for a job. I got in. I started work there from eight to twelve, and I would bathe the dog. She would rough the dogs in in the morning, and I would bathe the dog. Her father would dry the dogs, and Jimmy Andrews, who is the reason why I'm talking to you, is. Uh, he was in school. Jimmy was about um, 14. And he would come over after school and finish the dogs. So I would go to, I worked there to 12 and then I'd go to the, to the drugstore and uh, I would um, uh, work there until from 2 to 10. But every time I got to deliver over that way, I would go by there and see what the dog looked like because I didn't see them finish. I just saw them when it came in cruddy. And back in the 50s, poodle was unbelievable. Most of everybody, was poodle. <laughs> I think most of them was all uh, silver sparkle of sassafras <laughs> and peekapoos. But anyway, so Hazel saw my interest. I mean, coming by there all the time. And she said, uh, Jean, do you think that you could do this? And I said, yeah, I think I could do that. I mean, I'm a person like this. If I see you do something, I can do it better than you can tell me how to do it. So uh, she said, well, when we get a standard in, which we didn't have any of standards back in the day, every most was minis and toys. And she said, we will let you try on a standard poodle. So this poodle came in by the name of Pierre, and the last people's name was Kate. And I did the feet on him, and Hazel praised me and told me I did a good job and everything like that. And so um, I was thrilled, you know. So, uh, so when I, and no standard came in again, so then a miniature poodle came in. Her name was was Fifi. <laughs> uh, 
Go figure. <laughs> and I really. And so I, I trimmed the feet on it. She said, Jane, you did a good job. She said, you can do a little bit more. You can you know, trim the face and stuff like that. So I trimmed the face and I trimmed the ears. Back in those days, most of the poodles wore tassels on the ears like uh, Bellington. And so I watched, but not quite close enough. I mean, I shaved the ear, but I went against the ear on the inside of the ear and wrapped it in the flea pocket. I nicked this dog's ear. Now, I'm 18 years old. I'm screaming like a banshee. Hazel, <laughs> what's wrong? What's wrong? I cut this dog's ear off. Okay. <laughs> so Hazel looked at it and she um, got a piece of ice and put a piece of ice on it and stopped it bleeding. And so um, I said, I want to take her to the vet. Well, right next door to the drugstore was a veterinarian clinic named Slay and McDonald. And they, Hazel used to have a grooming shop in their clinic before she opened up a grooming shop there. And they had a cocker that was a grandson of Rise and Shine that won the garden. Oh, okay. Wow. Anyway, so anyway, and I'm going to tell you something. I may mention a lot of dogs, but I mentioned dogs by name. I don't remember their registered name. I know most of their call name. But anyway, so she said, Jane, it's okay. So I took the dog to the vet. She called the vet and told him I was on the way. I went over there and they had to scuffle to get two stitches in it. Now, this is in September. So I um, uh, uh, stayed there until they, uh, well, I went to work. And then I took the dog back, back to the, uh, the grooming shop. Then I went back to work. And so after they, they had did what they did, I took the dog back over there later on. So I worked there for a week. And I said, this is not for me. I quit. I quit working at the poodle shop. I, it, was just, it just bothered me because I said, I couldn't stand up sight of blood. I mean, like even in the country when we used to butcher hogs and stuff like that. I mean, I would run the other way when we had to kill the hogs. I mean, it just did blah, blah. But it didn't bother me to go hunting for rabbits and squirrels and stuff like that. Anyway, so uh, around about our November, Thanksgiving, <clears throat> Jimmy and Hazel came by the grooming shop. And I was, uh, they had a, a fountain there where most of uh, drugstores back in those days had a fountain, lunch fountain. Mm-hmm. They came over for lunch. And so we didn't talk about dogs and nothing like that. We just talked. And Jimmy, Jimmy didn't know me too well at that time, but he'd say, he was scouting me out in order to see what I would talk about and stuff like that. So they, uh, they went back to the, to, the, to, the, to the grooming shop and Jimmy called me. And he said, Gene, would you like to have a job? And I said, doing what? He said, grooming dogs. I said, no, I can't do that. That's not, I can't, I, I, I can't handle that. So anyway, so he said, well, Hazel and I talked about it, and we think that you could do this because, you know, you got potential. So Hazel knew Mr. Northrop, who owned the drugstore, and she talked to him. Yeah. And Hazel had met my father, and my, she talked to my father. So the two of them talked me back into growing, going back to work at the poodle shop. And like Mr. North told me, he said, Jane, I would hate to see lose you as, a, as an employee, but you said, she said, there's a future for us, Hazel and Jimmy think, and the dogs, and they think you should do that. So anyway, I gave him a two week notice in November, in December. I started working full time at the poodle shop January the 4th in 1955. I went to my first dog show in March of 1955. That is when the Houston Kennel Club show was right there at the Coliseum downtown in a, in a, in a garage. So I went to the dog show there and that just blew me away. I mean, well, it just, things that bother me then sometimes bother me now. It's like, it bothered me to see the dogs in crates because of the fact that all of the dogs ran loose and stuff like that. And it bothered me to see dogs in crate. That's the one thing. The other thing that bothers me is that person that stood in the middle of the ring, and I stayed there until the last bony finger was pointed, like Anna used to tell me. <laughs> uh, that person stood out there in the middle of the ring and said, this is the best dog in the show. That was hard for me to accept, because what gave him the knowledge to know that that was the best dog in the show? So with that being said, I started trying to learn as much as I could about dogs. I mean, what I mean by that is I got the encyclopedia and I got started studying pedigrees, which had nothing to do with 
showing dogs, uh, judging dogs, but I tried to learn as much as I could about dogs. <laughs> so anyway, and um, I didn't, uh, so I just, I didn't have a dog, couldn't I like that. I wasn't in, in thinking about showing a dog and I like that. So there was a, a woman who, I don't know, a young girl, I don't remember her name. Bo Bankson tried to make me remember her name. I couldn't. She had an inch on Port Saluki, a grizzled bitch that I showed in 1957. I won the breed under, um, oh, what's his name? Um, I think of his name in a minute. But, uh, and this bitch was very saluki. I mean, she didn't want to be touched and she was going around me. I didn't know how to make a stop. I mean, she had me tied up and not going around me. And so um, the air that, that I was greatest sighthound judge. Uh, uh, I'll think of his name, but anyway, so I wanted to breed. That was the first Saluki I've ever shown in my life. And then I got involved with Norman Austin. Norman Austin was a real good friend of Hazel Ham. And so he was a real good front friend of Marie and Otto Wazels, who are on Lock Lane Kennels uh, 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 in Houston. Because he showed black cockers from the, the Levies, and he would they they would come, they, he would come down there. And so Norman was one of my greater mentors because of the fact that Norman was a great breeder, he was a great mentor, he was a great handler, but he wasn't a great groomer. I mean, he couldn't he couldn't groom real good, okay? But he did enough to get by. Don't get me wrong. So. Sure. I uh, I start uh, going to shows along with Jimmy Andrews with him to a dog show because I had no way to get to no dog shows and Hazel she didn't show very much she had a, she had poodles and Maltese and she didn't go that often and so I start going to shows with him well not as much with him I was with him at the show but I went to the shows with Marie and Otto Wazell did you know the Wazells no they own the Lock Lane Kennel they had some great ass cop cock okay so anyway. <clears throat> So I would go to show with them, and I would be with Norman all the time, watching him show dogs and stuff like that. And so um, uh, things, uh, in 1962, <laughs> I, I, a, a woman came in the grooming shop, and I was still working for Hazel at that time. I only worked for one kennel, Dog Patch Kennel down in Hollington, Texas. And a woman came in the, in the grooming shop. Her name was uh, um, Nan Green. And so she uh, had a tar poodle, an apricot tar poodle, which apricot was a thing back in those days. Beautiful puppy that was terrible. It was a long, dwarfy thing. And she was going to have a groom so she could take it to the vet to have her spayed. And I had learned a little bit about spaying. I mean, I didn't know anything about spaying, neutering, and like that. So I told her, I said, oh, she's so pretty. Why would you want to spay her? And she said, oh, well, I don't want to breed her or nothing like that because she's not. Anyway, so I talked to her and I'm not spaying her. And she made co me co-owner of her. And we bred her, which was my first litter of dogs I've ever bred. And <laughs> are you ready for a laugh? Okay. That was my first kennel name. Melly was her name. Melly Green was her name. So we ha we named her. Uh, the, the first uh, litter we had was uh, Peppy Le Pew of Dorjean. Okay, that was her Dorothy. Dorothy was her name. Dorothy Green. And Dorothy, and so Dorjean was Dorothy and Jean. Dorjean. So, <laughs> Jean so anyway, and then I, um, we had uh, six, four puppies, and they was pets. I mean, Pepe and, Pepe and Cha Cha. That was, uh, one of them was white, and one of them was black, and that was their name, the two that I kept, and she didn't want any. So anyway, so then in 1956, I showed a IG for, Charlotte Brown that live in Texas, down in Texas. And I, um, I, 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 I uh, did quite well with them. And so 
I bred him to John Hutchinson. You knew John Hutchinson, didn't you? John Hutchinson, he was a, a person who had um, um, whippets, and he was a real good friend of, um, oh, I can't think of her name now. It'll come to me now that had Bulldog in, in San Antonio, Texas. <laughs> Jack Potts showed for her dog, her dog for her. Mm -hmm. So he had, and, Jack, and, and John had this, his name, he had a, a, a IG name, Uno. Uno was his name. So I bred this bit that I finished to him, and I got a son of his called Uno Dos, and it looked very much alike. Anyway, that was my first uh, 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 IG bred, uh, litter I ever bred. And I only bred maybe six different breeds. But I never met, bred more than oh six litters out of any one breed. One breed. I mean, I don't. We did. I, I don't. I don't believe in breeding a lot of dogs because I believe in breeding dogs for myself. Mm -hmm. Like Joel and I, we breed dogs. I mean, they stay here until they go into little boxes in there. But anyway, so um, so I took this uh, puppy down to um, Millie. And so, in, in Texas, and I saw this Afghan, well, she had a birdhouse there, and this birdhouse, uh, you look in her kitchen, you see birds going across, and they disappear. And she had doors, uh, houses where they go into. And I was looking at the birds, and I saw this thing go across the window, and I said, what is that? And the, the dog got in the background, and she said, oh, that's Calico. That dog, Calico, was... Uh, Ammon Hall Black Magic, who was a a um, was bred by Ned and Sue Kaufman. Wow! <laughs> and so, uh, Mel A. Green and I uh, wanted to have an Afghan. So we had. I had. A, I took a gun dog, a gun smoke daughter, and bred it Black Magic. And well, but first, let me tell you about Black Magic. I said he was a dog that that I showed him on the Texas circuit. I put about seven points on him, and Ned and Sue heard about him. And Ned was retired. Ned Ned, Ned Kaufman was retired, so he Jay Ammon bred him. Wow! And, and so he uh, Ned got him and took him to the Midwest African Hound Specialty, and he won especially from the classes after Ned had finished or retired and the rest of kind of like history he black magic was a, a, a good producer but uh, because he was out of nomad oh, okay so anyway i'm in hall nomad but anyway so that was my first lit of afghan and that was in about 1968 and um i, I had six puppies and i named one of the dog that I kept, his name was Shedrat. Jamil Shedrat Apudat. And now we, that's where the second <laughs> Kellen came in. Pudat, Poodles and Afghans. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and, and, but then there again, the Kellen was not never named or remembered or anything like that because there was no breeding done with the Kellen's. And so I showed him quite a bit and he did a lot of winning. He was a Brenda dog that did a lot of winning. I mean, like I beat Phaedra uh, uh, Gerda's bitch a couple times with him and he did quite well and so Johanna Tanna who's Xander Duquennel she got her first bitch from me that was her foundation bit that she got from the litter which was the bit that I wanted to keep but I went to a dog show and Melly sold her while I was gone and oh, that's geez. So because I wanted to keep two, I wanted to keep a dog and a bitch. But she told that bitch, and I didn't want another one to bitch. And I didn't know a lot about dogs. I mean, I knew enough to know. I think I've always had an eye for breed type. And that's what all about my brain is breed type. I'm, I look at this dog game different than a lot of people in regards to what dog to bred for and everything like that. To me, it's all about breed type. Breeders are the one who is the backbone of the dog game, in my opinion. Well, there's no question. 
that's but then you can get into another part of it. I mean, a lot of people say we, we like friends like judges. We judging breeding stock. Breeding don't go in my mind when I'm judging a dog. The only thing in my mind is breed type to the standard, find the best dog in the ring to the standard against competition. What is bred to do? That's up to somebody else. I mean, it, what it produces, that's up to the breeder. I mean, if, if in my opinion, if dogs would produce all these great winning dogs could produce as well as they are, we would have better dogs. Just because a dog went in the show ring don't mean it's going to produce. And it's and like in the field, it's judged by that judge in the field. Not me. You could, you take like a dog in the field, you could care, that, that judge in the field could care less what it looked like as long as it's performing, as long as it's doing what it's bred to do. Now, with, the, with that being said, I do want a dog that has the makeup of being able to do what it's bred to do. But now from the standpoint of it's winning, like Annie Clark, Mike Billing, and James Forsyth. We talk about this all the time, really. We and and I haven't got into my mentors, who really, which I really learned so much about. But anyway, so and then I start showing uh, poodles, and um, then that's when I got involved with Frank Sabella. Frank Sabella used to come on the Tech Circuit, and he was my idol. I mean, otherwise, like I was, he couldn't turn without me being there watching him, not only him, but all the California handlers like Mitch Wooten and, and uh, Harry Sanks. Harry Sanks, really, I wouldn't probably be talking to you now if it wasn't for Harry Sanks. And Harry Sanks, yeah. he, oh, listen, he, 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 he drilled it in my head things that I have never forgotten. And, uh, and um, uh, Tony Gwinner, and that was when Corky was working for Harry Sanks and Rick Platt was working for Tony Gwinner. They was really good buddies. They came on the Texas circuit. Jack Funk. Yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, Doug Boondock. I mean, a lot of those old Terrier people. And I was not around a lot of them. But anyway, and I'm not name dropping. I'm just naming people who really I learned so much from because I'm a learner. I mean, other ways, like right now, there's a lot of time I'm sitting at rings out watching, judging, and somebody asks me, oh, you think about getting into that breach? Ain't no. I'm learning dogs. I mean, listen, and if there's two dogs in the ring, I'm going to judge them. I'm going to see what that judge judged them, and I'm going to see how I would have judged them. And that's where I think that a lot of learning is lost. I mean, there's right now, even I'm not criticizing judges, but even judges, my God, they, they finish. They finish at 2 o'clock. They don't do it in a group. They go on to the hotel. And then me, that's not me. I'm going to stay there until the last bony finger point. And I, that's, that, I mean, dogs are in my blood. I mean, I can't get away from that. But anyway, so I start showing a Saluki for Paula Chato. Her name was Paula back at that time. She owned Baghdad Kennel. I showed a Saluki for her that was the number one Saluki dog when Frank Sabella was showing Moon Todd. And that was in the late 60s. And, uh, and then Paula, she didn't really trust the pedigree. And Paula will argue with me about this. And so she went to Janerby and went Jensen and got involved with Janerby. That's where she met Alan, uh, Alan, Alan. Yules. Alan Yule. Yeah. Alan used to come up to Texas, I mean, up to uh, California and get a lot of dogs and from from Wayne. So him, that's when him and Paula met. Wow. Anyway, <laughs> um, and the rest kind of like the history there. We, we know a lot about that. But anyway, so, and, and then I got involved with Dar Rogers. And Dar Rogers owned Apollo. And he took a Scheherazade bitch, Wally Breeding, and bred it to Nomad. Her name was Kissy or Scheherazade. And he bred her to Nomad. And he got the, the astronomic, the, uh, what do you call it? The, um, uh, like, like um, Apollo, Athena, Aphrodite, uh, the astronomy litter. So, and I was showing another Afghan from him that he had from Wally. His name was uh, Le Sabre of Scheherazade. And he was, he was a beautiful dog, gorgeous, coated, a little bit short on legs. And, but he, he, I did quite a bit of winning with him. And so when his litter was born, 
uh, I finished the whole litter, but but one. Dora Rogers finished Apollo himself. He finished him at 17 months old. And so I was showing um, a Lesabre, so he wanted me to show Apollo at the, at the National. And I didn't think he was ready to be shown, but, and we want to tell you something, I learned at a young age to not show dogs unless I felt it was a quality, because I had great mentors that would tell me. They would, a judge would tell me if this dog was a quality to judge, a show. And I turned down a lot more dogs than I showed because I was never a big time handler. I mean, I went to, I went to a dog show once and I had eight poodles. They would all look good when I left the kennel, but the grooming shop, I didn't have a kennel at that time when they left the grooming shop. But when I got there and I took them in the ring and then hey, they were poodles. And when I went back and they was not put together, I had people working for me, but I looked at this dog and I can't take this dog in the ring. So I cut down on what I was showing. I could only show, I showed what I could get in the ring. Sure. Because, see, I'm starting in, in, in a really, not only that I'm showing, I mean, I guess the top handlers, but the grooming, <laughs> that is something else. And I don't take a backseat to anybody in grooming dogs. I mean, really, I said, I'm, I'm a great groomer. I mean, and I, I'm, like Frank, Frank wanted me to work for him, but I couldn't work for Frank because that was in 1966. And I was thinking about getting married. So therefore, I could not afford to work for a handler and make a living. Right. And, and <laughs> you had to kick out of this. They used to call me Suntan Sabella <laughs> because I used to hold my hand like he did when he showed me. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so uh, Doyle wanted me to show Apollo at the National. And I told him, I said, Doyle, I don't think he's ready to go to the National. He was a big old 18-month-old fuzzy bear. I mean, he had this coat that you wouldn't believe. So I suggested that he would get somebody else to show him. And I recommended Rosemary because Jenny Withington did the national and she would like Apollo. I mean, he would, Apollo was a dog that anybody would like. I mean, Apollo was to this day, well, out of all the Afghans I've ever had on my hands on, I don't think I ever had a dog had a better head than Apollo. Really? Apollo had one of the most outstanding head that you're going to find on an Afghan. He had under jaw, he had chiseling, he had that look when you don't, you don't look at him, he looked through you. I mean, he, was, he had that, that look of an Afghan, which they don't have a soft expression. They look through you or whatever. Anyway, uh, Apollo had his faults like every other dog. But I mean, and like Aries, his brother, I mean, Aries won best in shows, I think, when he was 11 years old. I finished Aries too before Carl and Walter got him. But anyway, so Apollo went to the National. And I tell you what, have you ever seen that video that was made of the Afghans from the 40s to the 80s and 90s? I don't think so, no. I'll send it to you. Okay. I mean, uh, I, 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 I appreciate that. Huh? I'd appreciate that. It's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's, you, you can see all the Afghans and what we went through with Afghans from the 40s to the 80s and 90s, and when we went through, dogs would not coat, we didn't have to take care of them, I'd take care of the dog, we had all this coat to the point where we start sculpturing them, which despise, I despise what they're doing with Afghan, the way they shave their necks and stuff like that. You can't see an Afghan with a bib. I mean, they shave them with a, well, you know how I feel, you know, because we have talked about that. Yeah. And they're to shaving faces on Afghan. But anyway, never, anyway, so nevertheless, so Apollo went to the National, and Jenny was and gave him the, the specialty. I went with this bitch with his sister. And you're going to see this in the video that I send you. You're going to see all the great Afghans in there. Paul Stass, uh, 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 all the great Afghans back from the 40s to the 60s, 70s, and even 80s. So, um, and then uh, I, um, I showed Apollo, and he was my first top winning dog. I mean, I won more with him than any other dog other than Kareem. I won more with Kareem than I did with him. But, you know, the Saluki. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, that, uh, it's not him. It's a picture right here with him, him somewhere. But anyway, so, um, uh, and then in 1973, I was lucky enough to win the group at the garden with him. By... <laughs> Pat Trotter getting beat in the breed. 
The only time she got beaten to breed, I think, at the garden is that year that I won the group at the garden. And it was a great lineup for me because of the fact that, I mean, with uh, Joe Cocker, he loved the dog and he loved Pat's Alcon because we had shown against each other. In October in Washington, Pat and I, they used to have two shows in one day, two, de- uh, two shows, uh, one, one show in two days. And there were three day, three shows, three groups in one day and three groups in that show the next day. And so Pat was there. Pat won the group. I went second to her under Joe Tacker. But Joe Tacker liked Apollo as well. He had gave Apollo groups and stuff like that. But that year, as I said, Pat got beat in the breed by a gentleman who is campaigning a dog now that she bred. And he beat her in the breed. And so I always tell Pat, I say, I love you for getting beat that day. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, um, and after that, uh, Apollo did quite well. And so I went to a dog show in Corpus Christi, Texas, and Dar Rogers had a special crate made up for Apollo. And I was coming from, from Mac Allen to Corpus when I heard Apollo make a noise, and I didn't know what it was. So I went on to the dog show and I um, I showed him and that's when I met Wally Pade. Wally Pade was in the stand there and he was amazing. I mean, he was talking about uh, that dog. What a great dog. He would look at him move. I mean, you know, Wally, you've been around Wally when you get excited about a dog. And so I don't know, <laughs> somehow Apollo was a back sleeper and he must have turned over and his that crate had a, a lip there and I think his tail could have got caught in there and it fractured his tail in the third vertebral. And so I took him and I um, I won the breed and I won the group. And that's when I uh, uh, realized that his tail was fractured when he, when he won the group because Apollo had what I call a relaxing top line. I mean, Rosemary would punch him in the gut, and he'd put his top, top, top line up, and he would hold up that little line, but it was relaxing. So I would do him like a sporting dog. I would pull his tail at the base of it to make him use his muscle, and he would stay there forever, you know, until he finally relaxed and until his muscles go down or whatever. So, and he kind of went when I pulled his tail a little bit, but it was still on the end and not in the third vertebral from the end. So I dog came over after I won the group, and I told him that I think – Apollo hurt his tail. So we left Corpus and went to Houston and we took him to his vet and that's when we found out his tail was fractured. It was not broke, it was fractured. So Dahl would not keep him while I went on to the Texas Circuit, which was Shreveport, Longview, Dallas, and Fort Worth. So I had to take him with me. So what the vet in Texas did, he put a, a splint on it. And the splint was kind of heavy. So at 11 o'clock, at 11 o'clock that night, uh, Apollo turned over and he shook. And that thing slipped. And that's when his tail broke. Oh, so I don't know what to do. I called Dar Rogers. Dar Rogers, Dar Rogers, he was a doctor. He was a pathologist and he was a lawyer. And so he um, called somebody in Tyler, Texas, a vet in Tyler, Texas, to uh, put a pin in his tail, which he did. But the pin he put in there, one dollar was too big or whatever, and it got infected. So then he lost his last three vertebrae on his tail. But it didn't hurt him. When Alan Teller bought him and showed him, he still won after he was shown. But And Darl and Betty was going through a problem there, so... They got a divorce, and so Apollo was sold to, Al- to Alan Tully. And I was showing the Nemo to Shih Tzu Humdinger, who J.M. and Brad, that Dahl Rogers owned as well. Oh. And, he, and um, he sold him to one of Jane Forsythe clients in New York, a doctor in New York or whatever. Anyway. So and then and 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 I and that's when I lost Apollo. I mean, and and that that really took a toll on me because of the fact that it was in 1973. I was having family problems at home, and so I ended up getting divorced in '73, and it was kind of tough on me. That was one of the tougher years. That's when I moved to Oklahoma. But because of 
it was because not only because of that, but it was because of the fact that gas was rationing. And in Texas, I mean, you had to drive all day to get across Texas to a dog show. And if, what we did is I had a client that had Kazon that lived here in Oklahoma who he took a circumference and made a, a thousand miles radius of Tulsa and seeing how many shows I could go to Colorado and um, Arizona, I mean, uh, Florida, um, Kansas, Oklahoma, Iowa, all those shows. So that's the reason why I moved here. And and they, and we was going to go into a, we was going to have a boarding kennel. They had seven acres and right next to the second seven acres, we bought an acre of land. They didn't want to have it on their land because a lot of, it was kind of like uh, hilly and stuff like that. So it would have been hard to build a kennel there. So anyway, make a long story short, they got a divorce and that ended the, that ended the kennel thing there. And um, that's kind of like pretty much, you asked me a question about how I got in dogs. So I went on a lot about what I went in dogs. So. I, and I can go on and on about dogs. And, and I, I, uh, I can give you a little bit of a scenario like, like Kareem. Um, I was at a little course, and Bob Mason, who was a judge there, he was a judge, and um, Jeff, Jeff, I can't think Jeff's last name now, but he had Kareem there, and he was seven months old at a little course. And I was showing the number one Saluki in the country at the time, a grizzle bitch. So he came up to me and he said, he said, Gene, would you like to show him when he grew up? I looked at him and I said, grow up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, so he was seven months old. And that was in September. He was born January 1st, January 3rd. And he showed him, Jeff showed him here in Tulsa to Langdon Scarter in the puppy class and Lang gave him the breed over my bitch. So I'm getting ready to go on the Florida circuit and so Jeff called me and asked me, Gene, do you know anybody would like to buy Kareem? And I said, no, not really. I said, but I'll be happy to see if I can find the right home for him. So he, um, I said, I'm finna go on the Florida circuit. I said, but I give you a call when I get back and see if you still want to sell him and I'll see if I can find a home for him. So I went on the Texas circuit. I got back and I called him. I said, Jeff, you still want to sell a dog? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, um, I don't know nobody I want to buy him. I said, but I'll buy him from you depending on what you want for him and make sure you get in the right home. I ain't going to tell you what I pay for him. <laughs> I pretty much stole it. What, what happened is his wife, was a daughter of of, of um, the book, uh, I can't think of their last name now. Okay, so anyway, so he she had used the credit card, and they had a couple kids, so he needed the money to pay off the credit card. <laughs> so I bought the dog, and I never put him in my name. I never found the right place for him. I mean, Ed Jenner really was interested in him, but he wanted Luke to show him, and that wasn't going to happen. You know, <laughs> anyway, he go, he go. I'm, I'm going to show him. So, Joe had an accident in '80, and I gave him to her when she was in the hospital as a gift. And when I took him on the Texas circuit in 1980. And he was um, 13 months old. Betty Stike said that he looked like a raw bone athlete when she first seen him. Because he was underweight. He had worms when I had him, stuff like that. So I finished him very fast. First time Joe saw him, he went best in show. Wow. And he won, he won 30 best in shows. He was the top winning Saluki in the breed for about from 82 to 86. And his son was top winning Saluki after him for a couple years. Uh, Z was his name. But anyway, and so that those are my two top dogs. Now, I, I showed a lot of dogs and I did a lot of winning because of the fact that I was more selected about what I showed. And so with that being said, I mean, I, I, I won a lot. Like when I won, when I won Louisville. 
1986. It was the largest one-day show in America on a Canadian judge. Were you there? No. Who was it? Bob Waters. Oh, I love Bob Waters. With me both. Really, that man. Oh, yeah. He was I, great. I haven't got into any of my mentors that I learned so much from, but Bob Waters, listen, I mean, I, I go to the show. He was a veteran. Cream was a veteran. He won the brief on the veteran class under Gerda Kennedy. Um, no, no Alan, Alan Pepper. Alan Pepper. Another Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> no, Alan won, he won the group on the, uh, he won the, he won the breed uh, under Mike Billing. He won the group under Mike Billing. And Bob, when it, Bob, Bob, Bob Waters went and did this and show. Well, the dog that I'm thinking I'm going to have to beat is George Boyd. You know, really. I mean, because you know how you were. You went to the show. You knew what dog there. That oh, for sure. Yeah. Really. If George so, was there. <laughs> if George was there. You know? <laughs> so, and like I can name a lot of a lot of other icons. I would have had more best in shows if they wouldn't have been there. But anyway, so <laughs> George got beat in the group. Uh -huh. Okay. So after George gets beat in the group, and not only that, I got to win the group because Mike Billing is doing the group. Stan Flowers in there with the Harrier. Tommy Glassford was in there with the Bloodhound. I mean, really, it was a battle in there for the group. Oh, okay? for sure. Holy so, Jesus. So I went in the group. And anyway, so they start the groups at 8 o'clock at night. It ended at 12.03 a.m. It was in the other building over there. Clint Harris was there, and he got mad and left because of the fact they were introducing all these colonels and everything like that. Was It was a centennial show. So... After uh, after we went in the group, then I'm after George got beat. I'm thinking, well, I gotta beat another George. George Austin, he got the Springer. <laughs> 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 but I was lucky enough to win the Boston Show. Bob Waters pointed to me, and really, I mean, it was it was it was, it was, it was, it was unbelievable. I, it was really unbelievable. Oh, Bob Waters was amazing. I loved watching Bob. Oh, Waters. listen, Bob. I mean, listen, I'm gonna tell you something. He used to do some things that I. When I used to watch judges, and that's where I learned so much about judging is by watching judges. Because Bob Water, all the dogs come in the ring. They were not in catalog order. They just came in the ring. You, if you had the best moving dog, you try to get the front of the line. You used to fight to get the front of the line, okay? So all the dogs would come in the ring. Bob Water would be sitting over there at the desk over there as the dog came in. And he would come at, and look, go down the line, and he would change the dogs. As they came in, standing there, before he ever touched them. Anyway, so um, so he uh, and he would change them. Then he would put them on a table, and they would he would go over all the dogs. Remember those days? They would go over all the dogs, and then they would move all the dogs. That's the way judging used to be. I tried that when I started judging, but I couldn't. I couldn't find myself. I mean, what did I remember? What I saw? Whatever. So what Bob Water would do, when he put them on the table, he would structurally, he would place them. Then when he moved them, he would place them. And that's the way they stayed. But he would place them on outline, look in there before you ever touch them. He would place them on structure when he went over them. And then he would place them as he moved them. And that's the way, and Bob Waters was the only judge that I knew that did that. But he, I mean, Bob Wiley was a great guy. I mean, you, well, so, so you consider Bob one of your mentors? Uh, somewhat. I didn't really talk to him. I, I, he was a mentor. See, I had a lot of mentors that not necessarily talk to. Right. <laughs> he, was a, he was a judge that I, see, I'm going to tell you something. There was about eight judges that were my great mentors that I used to judge along with them. And I would write on a piece of paper the dog that I thought, then what I would thought, and I would put it underneath their book. They would mark their book and then they would look and see what I did. And if I was in the ballpark, they would give me a thumbs up. And if I was in the ballpark, they would give me a thumbs up. And we would talk about it. That's what's missing today. People, I mean, listen, judges don't have time to talk to exhibitors. Exhibitors don't have time to talk to judges or breeders or handlers or whomever. I mean, listen, you go in the ring, like this judge's report card. I, listen, I, I, it, it just kills me. It kills me when I read the stuff on the judge's report card when these people put stuff on there about what this judge like and what he dislike or whatever. Listen, you judge dog in the ring against the competition, against the standard, period. Right. And so what, what that judge did today, he may do a different thing tomorrow. And then for them to criticize judges 
on what they did or whatever. Now, if you want to criticize a judge on their personality or their um, uh, rudeness or something like that, fine. But not on their decision that they made against dog. Really, let me ask you a question. <clears throat> yep. what, do you, what do you think is the easiest class at the dog show to judge? Out of the whole day? Yeah. Best in the show. The easiest thing there. Six days, yeah. seven, seven dogs. Yeah. Okay, what do you think is the hardest? Oh, most definitely uh, the, uh, the breed level. No. You don't think so? No, no. You go to you get you get breed letters. No, the, the the group is the hardest in my opinion because of the fact that you are there judging a whole bunch of dogs at the best of what they are. Yeah. So you, it, it's a little bit stronger there. Listen, that that decision in the group rank, in my opinion, is the hardest at the breed level. You can easily pick out sometimes the best dog there and the best fit there in that breed but when they all come in that group there you got 27 dogs 25 dogs in there that you got to pick the best four dogs of their representatives of the breed of the group yeah I, I agree with that aspect of it but i also think that if you were judging the breeds all day long you're sort of placing them in your head that the dogs that you want to re or look at again in the group right uh, yeah, so yeah, one of some dog may some dog may jump out of you at the group and put, put on a performance you can't deny, but... Oh, well, most definitely. Not on that. I mean, listen, there's a lot of times you may go in the ring and you may have had in your mind in that breed ring what was the best dog there. When you get that dog in that group ring, he looks sometimes like a totally different dog. Right. I'm telling you, I, I, had a I had a case once when I was judging a poodle. He was a new one poodle. And... Uh, I don't want to get too much in dropping names or anything like that. But anyway, so he was a slug in the breed. He had a son of his there that was showing, looking great, and stuff like that. And so I told his handler, I said, you better get him to start showing. But if you don't, his son is going to beat him. And so she got him up. She said, well, he don't like the breed wing. I said, you got to win the breed before you can win the group. Great. And I end up, and the thing about it, it was a small ring. Because a lot of these small rings, a lot of these big, moving dogs or whatever they don't want to put out in that small ring so that's the reason why they look a little bit different in the group and vice versa you take this dog that really don't look too good in the group look real good in the breed ring because it's smaller or whatever you can't you, you listen i used to try to pre-judge before i went in a group but i i quit that a long time ago you judge the dog at the time at the competition you cannot oh. you cannot uh take that win or law from uh, what have you done before or whatever. But oh, no, but, I, but when you're judging the breed, you, say you're judging our setters and whatnot, and that dog stick, that dog catches your eye, of course he's going to stay in your head until the group. You're going to look at him. You're going to look at him twice, you know. Right, right. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I judge Labradors in Florida in January. I think I had 112 labs. Wow. I gave a breed to a bred by dog from Mexico. This dog was phenomenal. Phenomenal. He And this man from Mexico, he had a champion male that was a very nice dog too. I consider him for select dog, but I end up putting, I hate to call the name, but no. Rusty dog. Rust, and Rusty got a heck of a nice dog. I gave him select dog. And the last time I had judged, I had put, gave Rusty Dog to breed before. My best of winners, I mean, by my best to opposite, was a 9 to 12 puppy bitch. I gave her best to opposite over about 25 special bitches. These dogs, you should see these dogs. These dogs is amazing. I mean, uh, they, 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 I don't know. I don't have a soft spot for black labs, but to me, black lab somewhat stands out a little bit in regards to certain things about them, in regards to a yellow or even a chocolate sometimes. But anyway, but um, I don't, well, as I said, I don't judge dog by age. You got the best dog. It's over six months old. It's going to win. I don't care. I don't care who owns it. And I haven't gotten into that part of it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I look at this dog. We better get into it soon, Gene. <laughs> we better get into it soon. Okay, well, well okay, I'm going to get into it. I'm going to tell you something. You know what I despise more about anything in this dog game? It's advertising. Advertising? I think advertising destroyed the dog game. Mm -hmm. Because of the fact that I think that a lot of people think that 
I could care less who put up a dog where, when, or whatever. Like, let me tell you something. Like, I, I, did, I did a best in show in Florida. And I probably saw one of the second best dogs I've ever seen in my life with this breed come in the ring, and I gave it a best show with, without hesitation. And that was, I hate to talk about people, but that was that dandy did my, have you ever seen that dandy that, uh, just in pictures so far in videos. I haven't seen it in life. I'm stuck up here right now. <laughs> right, right. Well, this dog is amazing to me. I think he is, he, he's really is everything that I could read in a standard, see what a dandy is supposed to be. I'm not no dandy expert by no means, but I've been around this dog game enough to know what a good one looked like. Like, like for instance, like I would put a good dog up until I find a better one to put over it. Like, there is only one dog in this world that I have given five best shows to. One dog. There are couples that I've given three or four because I thought they were the best in the ring. And the one that I give five to was Mystique, mm -hmm. one of her 315 or whatever she won. I mean, I, I never denied her. I mean, to me, I think she was a magnificent shepherd. But... Um, um, I don't, I don't, I don't believe in um, putting a dog down because I put it up. I put it down. I put it up until I find one better to put over it. <laughs> I have a question for you, though. Um, let's say uh, a young handler. What advice would you have for a young handler? Well, a young handler today is. We don't have handlers like we used to because of the fact that they don't have the education. They can't learn from body. They can't learn from a handler. Like juniors, they can't go to the ringside and learn from a professional handler because we have very few professional handlers out there. Most of these people out there that go in the ring and all they do is feed the dog. They don't set the dog up. They lift them up and set them up and stuff like that. I mean, to me, I wouldn't talk that way. And maybe I'm in old school that I'm used to stacking my dog and setting it up and holding it, let the judge go over it rather than feeding it the whole time is there, stuff like that. Like, like to me, there's very few dogs that I ask the exhibitor to show me their bite. And that's the ones like Roddy, well, I don't judge Roddy, but I mean, like in that show or something like that, Doberman, uh, sometimes Labs, uh, sometimes Golden. Because most of the people, they want to go in the ring and they're feeding the dogs and they be trying to open the dog's mouth. And I'm not, I mean, some of these handlers, I ain't talking about, novice handler the dog is trying to get the food and they're trying to open their mouth they don't even know how to show the bite and stuff like that so i listen boom boom i've done it before i'm a lipper i look the lip up here and the, i pull the sides or whatever and i'm done i mean i've done it most time i have one over dog i have judged dogs and people say you want to see the bite i said i've already seen it they didn't even know i had did it i mean chihuahuas i mean listen to me to me i go put my head up there like this here and lift that lip there boom it's done like that it's 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 it's, it's, it's easy but the advice that I would give for a handler would be, as I said, try to learn as much as you can about the breed that you're showing. You as a seller, I'm a, a salesman, I'm a buyer. You got to sell me what you want me to buy. I mean, to me, the people who really, I will ask them to go to the corner and back. They go halfway or a third of the way and come back and I say, please, to the corner and back, I want you to sell me what you want me to buy. And then they, and a lot of uh, exhibitors of people would tell me, well, the other judge didn't want to go that far. Well, I'm not that other judge. I'm judging your dog. I, 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 I want to judge your dog to the standard against the competition, but you got to move. Like I have them go around the ring. Instead of them going around the ring, they make this a little bit of matchbox. To me, that's... That, 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 that's what I think that handlers need to pay attention to what judges ask them to do because we all are different. Yeah, for sure. You take like, like Jane Forsythe. I mean, like when she judged Junior, that was one of her biggest things, Judge Junior's on listen, seeing if they listen to what she tells them, ask them or whatever. And she really was tough on them if they didn't do what she asked them to do, regardless of how well they were presenting that dog. Yeah. If they didn't, if they didn't, if they didn't do what she, and I'm going to tell you something, and, 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 I, and I, okay, okay, did that answer your question about what handlers could do? Well, the advice, yeah. I'm going to tell you something, though, Gene. When I was working for Bobby Stebbins, he used to always, I think I told you this before, mm -hmm. he used to make the schedule, and, and whenever I had a break, 
he would tell me to go watch certain handler show dogs, mm -hmm. and a lot of times it was you. <laughs> yeah, you told me that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And Bobby, Bobby, I didn't know Bobby real well. I knew him when I went with the East Coast. But see, the only time I went to the East Coast is when I was showing Apollo. Because, I mean, I didn't go to the I mean, shows on the East Coast. Coast. I mean, I said, I mean, I never went on the West, West Coast. And the reason why I went to the East Coast because of the, this. When Apollo won the National, he was being shown and been beat a lot on the East Coast. Dar Rogers was such a fighter, he wanted to prove to the people on the East Coast that that dog could win. That's the reason why I flew to the East Coast. And see, Dar Rogers... He was taught in school by Dorothy Nichols. Dorothy Nichols taught him in school. In school. In school. Wow. And he he, uh, he would go to school and he would uh, foul out because of the fact that the tall guys coming in and he want to fight him and Dorothy would keep him out of trouble. But, and she taught Ed Bivens too. I mean, she they 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 TCU. But anyway, but okay. Now let, let's get into the mentors, people. That yeah, yeah. Them. Tell me about your mentors. Okay. You have to make this a two-part series, Gene. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, you know I'm a big talker. Uh, actually, some of my mentors was, uh, well, there I won't name them in order. But see, with me starting in Pulu, being around Frank so much, I knew a lot of his um, people that he was hanging out with. Tom and Ann Stevenson. Um... Uh, Oh, what's the name? Uh, uh, there, there was a number there. Okay, Ed Bracy. I learned so much about Ed Bracy. I was at a dog show once, and I, I carried a small group of dogs, so I would keep my dogs at the hotel. I would go to the show and exercise them, go back and dress and stuff like that, come back to the show. I came in the show about 9 o'clock in the morning, and Ed Bracy saw me coming in. He said, where are you going? I said, go and get my dog ready for the show. He said, this is not a bank. You don't come to work here at 8, 9 o'clock. I said, Mr. Bracey, I came in and exercised my dog and stuff like that and went back. And people like that, I mean, I used to sit around all those people. Did you ever know Ernie? Ernie. Ernie was a black guy who unloaded the crates and stuff like that. For no, all I didn't know him. I've heard of him. Yes. Well, he, he was a great guy. I mean, he, he was a great guy. And he was a good dog person. It's a shame that he lost his life like it did. But, um... There were so many people that, so many handlers and judges. I mean, Wally Day, Mel Downing. I mean, I can go on and on about people we talk dogs as well as me watching them judge. Mm -hmm. And I, as I said earlier, I'm really good about learning by watching more than you telling me. So, and, 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 and a lot of people had image on me that uh, didn't even know what they had. They did. You know, really. I mean, I said... Uh, uh, like Mike Belling, I mean, she uh, she was a great judge. She was a great mentor, and we competed. I mean, like when she was showing Afghans for the Felton's, I mean, I was showing Afghans. We showed against each other all the time. But I mean, I still learned from those people. I mean, those people uh, put an image, and like, and I can't forget what Norman Austin. Norman Austin, he was such a great. But there's uh, uh, so many people that I I. I can't name them all. It's a reason why that I'm here sitting talking to you that that I learned so much from. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, Ted Young, I learned a lot about him because there again, I mean, when I went to the East Coast, being with the Cocker Peepers, I mean, Ron Fabian and all those peoples, I mean, they were, I learned so much of being with them. Sure. I'm going to tell you, like one of the one of the best Cocker handlers, in my opinion, did you ever know Mike Kentzler? Yes. Mike Cantler could make a stick look like a cocker. <laughs> he had the hands that you would not believe. And Norman was the same way. I mean, Norman could take a cocker. And Teddy, all those cocker people, Teddy, Ron, I mean, all those cocker people could, would show a dog, but it's one is a little bit like, um, uh, what's his name? John, John, I can't think of his name now. I'm losing thoughts right now about names. But anyway, um, anything else that you would like to know about? I want, I want I, okay, I'll have one last question, then I'll let you go, Gene. Okay. If you could meet Gene when Gene was only 20 years old, is there any advice you'd give yourself? Mm hmm Yeah, what? What advice would you give a 20-year-old Gene Blake? 
I don't think I could give Gene Blake anything because Gene Blake did what he thought needed to be done to get to where he is. And I'm very pleased with my accomplishment in the dog game. I really am. I mean, as a handler, uh, the way I conduct them, I, I, they, they, we all could do something different somewhat. But uh, no, I'm, I'm very, very pleased. If I didn't live to see tomorrow, I can say I live a wonderful life. I mean, what the dog game have given me is something that I, is irreplaceable. Really, as I say, and 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 one other thing is I like to get into in the regards to that is like me judging. I mean, like hey, you know how I feel about tails, and most of the people in this world know how I feel about tails, and that's because of the fact that this that standard is what I make my decision from. I just made an article in 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 the um, Buster Griffon a newsletter about tails. And I can't get beyond that. I cannot. To me, that standard is what breeders have gave me to judge the dog by, and that's what I make my decision on. To me, breed tails is breed type to the standard. I don't have a thing about tails. Like, if I had my problem, my, my, my preference, a clumber, I would love to have a tail on it rather than have a dog tail because to me it makes it more balanced. But I don't, it's not that I don't have anything to do with nothing. It's what the standard says. And that's my take on that. But no, I don't think that I would do anything different than what I've done well, because as I say, I'm very, I'm very, I'm very pleased with the way I have conducted myself in the dark world. I think I'm pretty well um, um, respected. Oh, there's no question, Gene. Uh, uh, I mean, like I have been nominated for Judge of the Year. To me, that's an honor within... I mean, I mean, I won on a handler of the year. I think it's, it's somewhere around here. It's got, uh, but, uh, but, and, but not, and not, I didn't win it. The dogs won it. I mean, I was able to pilot them to what they were. And that's what it's all about. But no, I don't think I could have done anything different. I really don't. I mean, I really am pleased. And then let me tell you something. Do you want to wind this up? Listen, well, you don't know how much I am thrilling that you asked me to do this because of the fact that, it means a lot to me, really. And and and, and 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 like you, like yourself. I mean, like I mean, anybody talk. I mean, I think that you. I don't know all the handlers in Canada, but you did. You're the icon of the handlers in Canada, and I told you that before. And I'm sure every, there's a lot of people that have told you that. And it's not to make you feel big or anything like that, but it's a fact, and that's what it's all about. Well, thanks, Gina. So you'd be surprised how much influence you had on me from just watching yeah. you. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with that. I mean, listen, I mean, said, and like Bobby, it said, I mean, Bobby, we, we didn't talk very much and stuff like that when he was around Batman. I mean, we, I mean, and, and, and those other two up there, I mean, uh, Roy Holloway and <laughs> those guys up there. Okay. And wait a minute, you can't leave out. Farsight. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> and George Austin, listen, I called George the other day and blew his mind. I called him and talked to him on the phone, and we talked for about an hour or more, and he felt so good for me calling well, him. I talk to George a lot, and he, talk, he always talks about when you two were competing, when he right. had the Harrier. He always right. tells me that story. Right, but see, the only thing about that is this. See, Bob, uh, George had that a little bit wrong, because, see, we was not running for top dog. No. That was our dog. I mean, I, we, I'm paying the bills on that dog. I mean, ain't no client paying the bills on that. It was just lucky that he, we didn't know we was in the running until around about October. Wow. And, and so when we went, when we went to, uh, to uh, 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 he went to, uh, he went to Chicago. Then he went to Cleveland. I'm leading by two groups going into the last show. He went one group. In, in Chicago, and then he go to Cleveland. I think he won two groups there. That's what he told me there. So he beat me by one group. And Jewel sent him a note by saying and congratulating. He thought that was the most unbelievable thing a person could do. Yeah. But we was not in the running. And see, and I went to I went to Biloxi, Louisiana, four shows, and I couldn't get a smell of a group. I mean, Denny Moss was there with her white oxy, and I didn't get a group there. But anyway, but no, that that, that was just by luck. That we ended up there because we weren't we weren't trying to uh, run for an old like you ain't never ever you don't ever see an ad in any magazine on one of our dogs 
Like I told Joel, I said, if you want to advertise the dog, take my name off of it. I will not have my name on any dog being advertised. And I tell all my clients, I mean, all my friend handlers, I said, if you tell your client, if they put this ad in the magazine, for me to put the dog up, put that money in your pocket because the fact it ain't going to do them no good. I had a handler tell me, he said, Jane, I told a client of mine that, and he told me, he said, he told him, he said, if you give me the money that you're paying for an ad, and if your dog don't win no more, I give you your money back. The client told me, he said, no, I want my dog in the magazine. Tell me, I don't understand that. That don't make no sense to me. What? And I'm not knocking ads. Don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking advertising. But just think about how many times you could show that dog more. But most people don't worry about money. How many times more you could show that dog with that $3,500 ad that you put in the magazine, a $5,000 ad you put in the magazine. Sure. But <laughs> you're done. Okay, well, listen, I, I am thrilled and honored that uh, you asked me to do this, and I hope it turned out well. Well, thanks for your time, Gene, and give Jules my love, and I can't wait to see you guys somewhere. So. Okay, well, well listen, I really enjoy doing this, and if I can help in any way, don't hesitate to holler. Appreciate that, man. It's good to see you. Thank you. Take care. Good night. Thanks, Gene. I appreciate that. That could have easily been made into a two-part session with Gene. Well, if you like what we're doing here, make sure you press the like, share, and subscribe button. You want to get a hold of me, get a hold of me at dogshowtips at email.com. Or if you just want to find out what's happening at Will's World, just go to willalexander.net. And don't forget, you can find our podcast as well on all the podcasts, I believe, now. Thanks, guys. See you next week.